Buonasera a tutti. Good evening, everybody. Welcome and welcome back to the Stanford, to the Breyer Center for Overseas Studies in Florence of Stanford University. We're gathered here tonight for our third uh, talk of our spring quarter. And I'm particularly pleased to introduce our two speakers tonight who took a big seat and are seated among you, but I trust they'll come over here <laughs> as the time comes uh, for them to speak. Um, uh, Professor Kurt Frank and Professor Sarah Loesch Frank. Kurt Frank is a professor of chemical engineering at Stanford University. He received his BA in chemical engineering from the University of Minnesota and his Master's of Science and PhD from the University of Illinois. He then worked at the Santia National Laboratories in Albuquerque, New Mexico for five years before assuming a faculty position, position at Stanford in 1976. Kurt is currently an endowed professor and a member of the National Academy of Engineering. He studies polymers and other soft materials, um, soft materials for applications in biomedical devices. He also studies a number of other things that I only wish I could pronounce, so I cannot read them. Sarah Loesch Frank is a lecturer in chemical engineering at Stanford University. She received her Bachelor and Master's of Arts in Education at the University of New Mexico. She taught art in New Mexico for four years prior to moving to California, where her artwork earned, earned her a scholarship to attend the Academy of Art in San Francisco. Currently, she teaches various art-related classes through the Bay Area adult education and community colleges. Her artwork includes mixed media, calligraphy, and she does extraordinary things with that, and drawing and printmaking. It has been featured, her work that is, has been featured and chosen at Intel Corporation, at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., the Triton Museum in Santa Clara, California, the Filoli Gardens, beautiful place, and in a number of other places, as well as in, in the Bon Appetit magazine. magazine. Kurt and Sarah have been co-teaching a Stanford introductory sophomore seminar entitled Art, Chemistry, and Madness, the Science of Art Materials. And they've done that for eight years. They have recently introduced an intensive sophomore college class entitled Sophomore College and Honors College are two wonderful, two of many of the wonderful things that Stanford does, but that's a way where uh, small groups of very good students are gathered for intensive classes, seminars, that is, face-to-face uh, 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 -face with faculty members. Uh, uh, so they've recently introduced another, intense, another uh, sophomore college class, which is entitled An Exploration of Art Materials and Intersection of Art and Science. Kerr gives lectures on the chemistry and material science associated with art objects, while Sarah teaches the hands-on studio. Kurt and Sarah have been in Florence since January of this year for a six-month sabbatical. Kurt is being hosted by the research group of Professor Piero Bagnoni in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Florence. They have spent some time with our program, both academically and socially. And they've also been auditing Professor Timothy Burden's art history class and often have interacted with students and staff. Uh, the title of our talk tonight is, as you can read up there, Stress and Strain, Perils in the Life of a Painting. Thank you so much for giving us this talk. Thank you, Linda. So um, I appreciate those of you who gave in to your curiosity as what a chemical engineer might have to offer. I appreciate that very much. Can, can you hear me if I talk from this position, Alessio? Yes. OK. All right. So um, let me jump right in. Sir, do you want if wherever you're comfortable? So let me uh, begin the first part, which is going to be in an introduction, a visual introduction of basically how a materials engineer looks at a painting. That doesn't mean that he has to look at it or she uh, in only one way, but I'm going to try to focus on one particular way to give you a point of view. You may not accept it, but at least it's something that you 
I hope we'll realize at the end that it does exist. It's a way to complement art connoisseurship and understanding of art historical perspective. So uh, I'm going to do this with pictures. And um, pictures of things that you may have seen, because everything that I'm going to show here uh, has been generated over the last six months. I've been doing this for seven or eight years, collecting these, but I thought that it might be useful here in Florence to pick out some objects that you may know the history, you may know all the iconography, you may know the significance of these various pieces of cultural heritage. But I'm particularly going to focus on, on one thing, um, and that is sort of their physical condition. So, so let me look at the first one. And, and as you can see from this, either a portion of a predella or, or a private altarpiece, uh, sort of all of the standard players in this kind of a painting, iconography will help you uh, determine who's who here. But what I want to do is to point out these lateral striations. When you go to a museum and you go to a church, um, you probably have different levels of sophistication with regard to your understanding of the context of the various paintings and the particular techniques and styles and periods and so forth. Um, and it's certainly possible that you completely ignore any of these cracks because, you know, it's just part of what they do with age. It's the patina of age. It's accepted. If it's not there, you question it. And in fact, uh, um, a number of uh, very uh, successful forgers have developed techniques of introducing this crocodile uh, in an appropriate, uh, let's say, context for the type of material in the time period. So, so that's the first one, lateral cracks. Here's another one. These are inserts or, or details. And uh, you'll also see in, in the gold leaf uh, scattered through here, it's a little, can we get any of these lights down and, and still do the videotaping? Uh, because the, the crackler that's here, the crackle, if you will, uh, is still visible. That's much better. Thank you very much. But you can see the rather jagged cracks here, and also here, and somewhat here, and somewhat here, and, and here. There's also some radial cracks coming out from um, the, the halos. But this is characteristic of a particular substrate, a particular preparation. It's also potentially interesting to note that the sort of facial skin color here varies. Uh, there's a differential in the amount of the green underpainting that is showing through, uh, which means that the white and rose and red and so forth have faded away with time. It, it's most prominent here, less so here, and, and here it's not. Maybe there's been some retouching, repainting going on. But in terms of a comparison, a technical analysis would look at those kinds of, of items. Here's another one. Instead of the crackalure that I'm focusing on here, uh, I want to point your attention to some of these vertical cracks here that there apparently has been some restoration work on to try to pull them together. You can also see um, uh, up in here, there's a little sort of bow tie kind of divot that has been used to join two planks together to try to stabilize it. And, and movement over time has caused the gold uh, leaf to, to separate above it. Moving on from, from those uh, uh, particular uh, examples, I'll show you some here. First impression probably is that, oh yeah, I've been to museums where the lighting was unfortunate and, and the varnishing was really very good. So I had a great mirror and, and depending upon where I stood, I could see more or less or none of, of the painting. That's just a problem. You can't place lighting everywhere in optimum positions. However, uh, what you can do, and, and remember, my purpose here is not the piece of art. It's not the cultural context. It's looking at the defects. And this is very easily seen when you're looking and raking light at, at low angle, uh, these striations that are here. The, the panels, it's clearly a panel construction, uh, multiple boards put together, and, and they've curved. We're going to ultimately see why. Here's some more. Although the vertical pattern I showed in the previous slide is most common, there are also horizontal patterns here and here. There's some more vertical. There's some examples of, of attempted repairs here. 
Note that, that the image quality on this outside of, of these defects is not great. I'm trying to work with the lighting. I, I want bad lighting such that I can see these defects. Here's another one. This is um, a ceiling set of insets. And, and you can see, again, the cupping of the boards. And in this case, complete separation. You've probably seen all of these kinds of things, if not these particular elements. Here are some details. Details showing, and I think it comes through very clearly, these very large, broad area cracks. In some cases, you've got a preferred orientation. In others, it's, it's not. Here's one sort of centralized kind of defect. It's actually due to an, an impact. You have uh, essentially a series of lines at, in some sort of a periphery, an annulus, around the point of impact. That's depending upon the stress state. And then here, from the Vasari corridor, just last weekend, um, four portraits with variable degrees of, of crackleure, of crackle. And um, in what I want you to focus on here is the faces. If you look at the faces, you'll see that in this particular um, portrait, the face appears, at least for this image, to be relatively unscathed. Uh, here you can see uh, some of the cracks projecting in. Here it's pretty much uniform, and this poor fellow is is just really um, in an unhappy state. What we see here is a relative difference between where the cracking could initiate in, in a supporting under layer, a ground layer, could be in the paint layer, or could be in the varnish layer that's on top. Okay, so this is all a motivation for uh, these um, various kinds of, of defects and um, my, my colleague here, who's also my wife of a very long time, and co-instructor, um, is an experimental artist. She's always been working on a variety of different things with different media and, and frequently combining things that um, the physical chemist in me would say, you really shouldn't do that. <laughs> but, but, but the visual artist that she is uh, focuses on, on the impact, on, on, gee, this really looks neat, Kurt. And, and I try to give a reason why. And so that has led, after a lot of soul searching, into a couple of classes you've already heard about. The difference between these classes, and, and other than their titles, is the length of time and the distribution. It's a regular uh, uh, quarter-long class for the first one, the one we've taught the most. And this is mainly populated by, let's say, 70% uh, humanities. And so there's art history, uh, studio art, there's English, there's uh, political science, there's international relations, there's French literature, and then a smattering of chemists and chemical engineers and material scientists and mechanical engineers. By contrast, the second one, which we've only taught once, we're teaching again in this coming September, is mainly engineers and scientists. I don't know why, We don't because it's a similar content. Maybe it's a title. Maybe it's the fact that the engineers have a, a more impacted uh, curriculum during the academic year, and so they can take these accelerated courses in the summer. I don't know. But we, we have a thesis. The thesis is that a painting is a physical entity. If it's a physical entity, it's an object. It's something that responds to its environment. And it should do so in a predictable way. That is the point. We have linked to this hands-on studio activities that Sarah runs, field trips that Sarah runs, and you'll hear about that. But let me give just a few of the topics that are covered in, in the lectures that I give. And, and I talk a lot about pigments. And uh, some of the oldest pigments are the, the ochres, red and yellow ochre. These are from uh, some quarries in France. And uh, these mineral pigments had to be prepared by grinding. So you take sometimes, maybe it's easy in this case, but maybe you had a rock like azurite and, and you had to grind it up. Well, in that case, it depended upon how hard it was as to how difficult it was to break it up into little pieces. And so this is a scale from a, a number one here is talc, really, really very soft. A number 10 is diamond. This is a, it's called a nonlinear scale. As you go up each number, it doubles in hardness. And so, if you look at this, these are all different kinds of minerals, and, and things like the silicates um, and, and the oxides are at the high end. The oxides go into ceramics. The silicates basically are the formation, 
fundamental for clays. And so, it, a practical aspect, how much work is it to grind these up to make them small enough to disperse in some sort of a binder to make a paint? Another example here is with some plant dyes. And, and here you can take a, a dye and turn it into a pigment by simply, uh, essentially, uh, working with oh, something like matter or indigo and precipitating that dye on top of, it's called an inorganic material. And it basically covers the surface and so you've got a, essentially a particle, but now it's colored. And that is a common way of making uh, pigments that, that have the color that you wish, but the starting material is a plant. Now, the synthetic chemists have been busy over the years in terms of making new things. Uh, periodic table becomes important. Mendeleev invented this in 1869. He was not the first, but his has sort of stood the test of time. Let me ask you a question. What does this thing look to you like? It's a furnace. It's a furnace. And uh, what time period do you suppose this furnace might have been used? 1300s. Yes, as late as 1800s. Okay. Now, what you find in the 1300, 1400 time frame, this is an excellent answer, thank you, is in uh, woodcuts, this kind of laboratory would be used to describe what an alchemist does. Okay. This, however, this woodcut came from uh, Carl Wilhelm Scheele, who was a Swedish chemist in 1775. Mm -hmm. And so basically the point here is that the alchemists, regardless of what they were trying to do, they also used the techniques of proto-science, proto-chemistry. It's the same kind of laboratory process. And so that's an interesting factoid. Another one is this Perkins violet. In uh, 1853, W.H. Uh, Perkin, who was at that time about 19 years old, invented uh, the first synthetic dye made from coal tar. Turns out that his advisor, uh, university advisor, uh, had a contract or, or a mission at least to cure malaria. And he wanted to invent a new way to form quinine, which was the, the medication for that. He thought you could make it out of coal tar. Because London had a lot of coal tar then. It was just waste. And so he sent uh, William, young William, off to a garage. It's just like from Silicon Valley, the startup. Okay. And so uh, in William's startup garage, he played around with lots of different things, came up eventually with a compound, sort of a purplish compound. He called it, well, he called it a number of things, but eventually it became mauve. Okay. And this was the first synthetic pigment. It cost caught Paris by storm, and it was really one of the ways that uh, built this whole dye industry. This is called the aniline dye tree. Uh, unfortunately, most of the dyes that were synthesized after this first one in 1856 turned out to be either fugitive, that means that they basically disappeared, the color disappeared, or poisonous, or both. Okay. A few of these actually stayed, uh, the Hansa dyes, there's some up here in the 1920s or so that, that live. But right now, if, if you or your kids or your grandkids uh, go down to the local art store, they will find pigments made of these names, which may be a little hard to pronounce. They're called quinacridones, thalocyanines, and then aerolides or, or Hansa dyes. These are all organic chemicals, very complicated structures, but they're very, very stable. They're very, very uh, intense coloration. Here is where pigments are today. But they don't exist on their own. You have to put them together with something. And it turns out there are natural products that have been used for 1,000 years. Okay? Uh, egg yolk. How many have ever had a egg, let's say, fried egg, not a hard yolk, but a soft yolk, left on a plate overnight? Okay, who cleaned it? Uh, all right, maybe you threw the plate away. Uh, the, the yolk is a protein, it's a mixture of proteins and oils and fats and so forth, uh, and it denatures when oxygen hits it, and it, the, the, the protein molecule opens up, and all the sticky parts fasten to the surface. 
That's a great thing to have for a binder. So egg tempera is made out of egg yolk, really. And you'll see pictures shortly. Um, flax is a, uh, again, this is multiple millennia uh, in terms of usage from, from the flax plant, but it's to make a fiber. Do you know what fiber it is? Linen, okay. And so all of the linen clothing that the, the you know, Greeks and the Romans wore made from flax. Well, you can also take these flax seeds and press the oil out. And, and that le leads to something called linseed oil. And you can treat that in a variety of ways. You can heat it up a little bit and sort of pre-cure it. That's where oil paints come from, at least one kind of oil paint. Huh. It's also possible to take a connective tissue, um, let's say from skin of animals or animal hooves or things like that, boil it down. <laughs> And, and make a glue, it's another natural protein. Or, and this is very common today, you make an emulsion, it's an acrylic emulsion. This is what latex house paints are all about. And, and so, um, artist paints are very similar in chemical composition. They cost about 50 times more than a house paint, but, but nevertheless, it's essentially the same chemistry. These things hold it all together. Okay, uh, the last slide that I've got here, I'll turn it over to Sarah, is that um, all of these things will degrade. And for example, uh, here is an image from Chauvet. It's a French cave. It's one of these uh, um, coffee table book kinds of caves, wonderful images. Chauvet was never opened up to the public because of all the prior bad experience with Lascaux and Altamira and so forth with regard to respiration from visitors basically leading to a lot of moss and mold and bacteria in the wall, and then the wall sloughed off and you lose the pigment. So if you've got a source of water, that's a problem. If you've got a source of sunlight, that's a problem. Here's the solar spectrum. All the little zigs and zags in there are because of absorption of the radiation by oxygen in the air, by carbon dioxide, by carbon monoxide, by water vapor. But the part that hits the earth in the ultraviolet can cause fading in pigments. And here's an example of some pigments that have faded on the top, um, or excuse me, the bottom part was open to the light, top part was covered, and you can see the fading that's going on. You can also have paintings that, that are, uh, let's say, covered with pollutants. Who here has seen the Sistine Chapel ceiling before it was restored? Okay, well then you recall things like that. Who's seen it since, since it's been restored? Okay, it's different, right? And, and a lot of that is, is uh, let's say, uh, smoke from candles. It's been a response to prior restoration treatments where a variety of candle wax and, and grease and things like that have been smeared on to saturate this oxidized surface and make the colors stand out again. But then more dirt just collects. Uh, you can avoid that by essentially burying your painting under the pyroclastic flow from a volcano. Okay, here's Vesuvius. You can save your painting by putting it in an Egyptian tomb in a, a low humidity environment. You can save your miniature by putting it in the pages of a manuscript, okay? And so you keep out the air, you keep out the light, you keep the temperature constant, you keep the humidity well, low is good, but constant is what you want, and you can solve that. Okay, let me now turn it over to Sarah, and uh, she's got some comments. So <clears throat> my part is just gonna be what we do in the class, so the students will understand why these things happen. So I'll go briskly, because he's got some other th pictures, and one of them ties into this building. So you'll be able to afterwards go in and just peek at the painting and see what it really does. So this is the first day I have them, because I want them to get familiar with each other. We work with um, uh, graphite pencils. Um, you know, graphite pencils, if they have an H on them of any kind, that means there's clay involved. That's why those pencils don't write darkly. In America, those pencils. I don't know how they're numbered in Italy, but anyway. And so uh, a 9B pencil is sort of like better than chocolate, really a nice feeling on the paper, and, and really, really dark. 
And um, so they're trying out the different pencils. They're also trying out vine charcoal versus compressed charcoal. They're working with pastels. They're working with um, white chalk um, and Conti crayon and trying different things on different kinds of paper, dark paper, light paper, um, medium tone paper, and different textures of paper, and also some panels that have sort of a fresco effect. So it's almost like when they're doing a Sinopia, the underneath painting. This is when they're smashing up oak galls. In California, we have um, oak galls that grow on the trees. They sort of look like little Christmas balls all over the trees. Sometimes they're very small. They're wasps' nests. The wasps don't attack people, but they do att attack the tree. They lay eggs. The tree exudes this sap, and in that, in that uh, ball that it makes is a whole bunch of tannic acid, and tannic acid is good to make ink with. So they smash them up. We put them in distilled water. We heat them. Sometimes you can put in candle soot or melograna, pomegranate. Uh, rinds, not the seeds, and then um, also walnuts, so you can make some really black inks. And if you've ever thought, well, why would anyone want to do that? That's how manuscripts were done, was with that ink. And um, if it's left, when you write with it, it's very pale, but as the moments pass and you look at your writing, it's turning darker and darker and darker. Um, so they're smashing those. And then this time they're making bamboo pens or reed pens, like you see in the you know, in the tombs of Egypt, you'll see reed pens from the scribes. Well, they're making big reed pens, and it turns out that there are reeds that grow and bamboo that grows here that are really, really helpful um, because they work very well for writing. And they're also using stick ink. We talk about the formulation of stick ink. Um, and they're trying it on papyrus and paper. And they're also cutting the pen to fit the way they write. So if you write with a strong slant, you cut the pen one way. If you write, and you can draw with it then. This is when they're working with a quill. So they're cutting a quill pen. Again, right-handed or left-handed, it depends on what they want. And they were trying some alphabets. Eventually, we get to a steel nib, which is pretty reliable. But a lot of the students really like the organic pen. It flexes. It's like your the quill pen is like your fingernail. So it'll give, and you can write wider if you press harder. And, so this is, this is a class that's always interesting because the students crack the egg, they put the yolk in their hand, they have to put the white in a separate jar because the white is used for something else, but you roll the egg yolk in your hand, and when you finally see the gloss come off the egg yolk sac, so it's kind of wet and runny, that's what they're doing right there. And um, they'll transfer it from hand to hand, and then the last thing you do is pinch it over a bowl, and the yolk comes out, and the yolk sac stays in your hand. You wipe that away, and throw that away. But what's, what's left is the slime in the middle, and that's the really good sticky stuff. So that's what you use in a tempera. And you mix that with water and pigment. And we'll, we have some pictures of that. And the white, you beat with an egg beater, almost as if you were making a meringue or a big fluffy thing. Don't put sugar in it. And then you put it in a basin and let it drip. And what comes out is denatured protein. But you can use that for a form of gilding. Okay. So. The egg white will work with gilding. And then this is Susan Roberts Manganelli, who's the conservator at the Cantor Museum. And she studied in Florence, so she was very excited when we were coming. She likes people to, to stretch their canvas the traditional way with the copper tacks. But this student was adamant he wasn't doing that. And I do have staple guns for the speedy guys. So they stretch canvas on bars and then they gesso the canvas. We don't use the traditional gesso because it's made with white lead, but traditional gesso is such a delight to work with. You can see why artists, you can still buy it. It's in all the stores in the United States, even with all of our safety precaution things. Um, so the students have gessoed, and now they're turning off excess and getting ready to do the painting. So this is, this is week by week how the class goes. Here they are with gloves on and masks on. The one who doesn't have her mask and doesn't have gloves is her paint's already mixed, so once you've got it mixed, it's no longer airborne. So unless she licks her fingers, she'll be okay. Um, so they've mixed the egg tempera. It dries really fast, so you have to keep re-wetting re it. And then this is when they're doing oil painting. And it's very fun to watch the engineers 
try oil painting because I love to watch their faces because they always go, you know, this is actually a little bit fun. And I, <laughs> that's the point. Um, anyway, so, um, and some of them mix their paints. They use, when they work with oil paint, they mix it with poppy seed oil or linseed oil or walnut oil, safflower oil. Um, poppy seed oil is usually used for whites. And some of them get really excited with the oil business and then their paints don't dry and don't dry, it takes forever. Um, but it's interesting to see because these are the kind of things that cause the problems that he's talking about. And this, when we did the sophomore college, these students were, we have them all day for three weeks, every single day. So they're very intense and they were bringing in images to work from for their oil paintings. And um, we got some absolutely exquisite results from, from this class. Um, then we do handmade paper. So we talk about the fibers in paper. Um, they were made, it was made with cloth. It also, in the Asia, it's made with kozo and gompi and then abaca. So they get to make paper with all of those different things. Um, if, if you, there was a craft fair um, last weekend and uh, Fabriano was there and it was just a delight to watch. I think they finally got tired and they just thought I should leave, but <laughs> they, were, they were making paper the old fashioned way and showing the watermarks and all. So they, they make paper. This is the lab where we usually have to tell them it's time for you to go home because we're tired. <laughs> and then this is a field trip. We go to the conservation um, lab for Stanford. They have um, they can wash pages of books. The first time they said that, I thought, whoa, you really have a weird idea. But anyway, um, they use um, deionized water and wash pages, and rebind the books, put them back together, add in pieces. So it's very fascinating to watch them work. They make slip cases, and some of the books that they have are just astounding. Um, so that's actually a sewing for sewing books on tapes, and that big clamp is for clamping the pages together. That's David Brock, who's in charge of the lab. And then if you, I don't know if you know John Mustaine at the Bing Wing of the Green Library, but um, he brings out special things for our class. It, it gives him great pride when they go, oh, who comes to look at your collection of special things? And he said, well, he goes, he'll name off things, and then he goes, and then the chemical engineers always come, and it always makes people <laughs> Startled. Anyway, so um, this is Purcell's composition, his musical composition. This is marbleized paper from Florence from very, very long ago. And then this is gilding on a, a book done in the 1900s. Um, anyway, it's, it's quite an exquisite piece. He brings them out because you can go there as a student and ask for things. They'll bring them to you. They have them in an environmentally controlled place, but they'll bring them to you. You can look at them. It's just fascinating. And that's another class where the students usually spend a lot more time peering at things. And often, like when we had the William Blake prints out, we had students who went into the history of printmaking and did projects on that. We've had um, Albrecht Durer's books on the alphabet and a few other things. So. And then this, these were the final projects that we happened to have in the computer when we decided to do this talk. So this is just. This is just the most recent class, but students have done things like um, natural dyes from plants that grow around Stanford um, or California on linen, silk, wool, how the mordant makes them stay or fade, people that made ink with different plant materials. Um, the blotchy purple and red and yellow is handmade paper with different kinds of paper laminated together so that it's a handmade piece of paper. Um, the Friday is an oil painting because he hated the egg temper project, so he said, I'm making a portrait of an egg for my oil painting. <laughs> um, another student got very excited about the Book of Kells, so she worked on that. The colors aren't very accurate in the picture. Another student wanted to match a painting, so she worked with the computer image of a painting and then worked from there. And then the two pieces of calligraphy were by the, a student who never talked in class, hardly ever very quiet, very intense, was always a little slower than the rest, but a really interesting girl. And when she brought in her final project, there were five pages of different alphabets 
that she had after one class that she just fell in love with the pen and that was that was what she wanted to do so it was really exciting so those are the things that we do and now we're back to cook okay. So how much time do okay good okay so I'm going to go back and and now tell you at least some of the reasons why um, paintings crack and boards curl and, and things like that. And um, the question, I think it's a serious one in terms of, is this a materials failure? I look at these cracks and I say, sure. Okay? When I see cracks on the hood of my car, I don't call that you know any cultural heritage. I say, my car is falling apart. Um, and uh, but there is a very substantial community. I've been doing a lot of reading in the last six months. It's a very substantial community of uh, conservators and 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 uh, art historians who are very upset with the issue of um, you know uh, let the painting do what it's going to do. Let it age. It's supposed to age. We've got all these uh, paintings that have basically live through time. They, they've got the gray hair to show it, and, and, and that's the way it is, and that's the way it should be. Either point of view is fine, but I'm looking at that narrow point of view in terms of the material's response, because I think that one can make a case that um, it's a predictable response. If you know what the material is made of, if you know the technique that was used, if you know the environment that the painting was placed in, then ultimately you can predict the response. I and mean, that's what engineers do, okay? And this is basically a composite structure. That's my point of view. And if you want some up close and personal uh, kind of uh, introduction to Crack Alert, go next door. When the reception occurs in, in a few minutes, uh, the painting on the wall is uh, Penitent Magdalena, okay? And I, I just found out the attribution here today. Maybe Linda gave it. Uh, 17th century. Um, the school of, maybe the studio of, or those who are following Giovanni Biliver, um, born in Florence to Flemish parents, painted in Florence and in Rome, and, and this is the painting on the wall, and this is one of the shots that I, I, I picked off with a certain sort of reflection and so forth. But if you look a little closer, and I ask you to look a little closer when you go next door, this is what you'll see. So, so one level of magnification, here, here are some images in, in the sort of you know, black and, and red region. Here's, here's a more magnified version, and this is what I'm talking about. This is the kind of, um, it's a response, it's a material response. Now, if you're looking at this from 20 feet away, do you, see, do you see it? Probably not. So then it doesn't make any difference, does it? If you look at it more closely, now maybe that's an inappropriate way to try to view the overall painting, but if you look at it more closely, this is what you're going to see. And so the question is, why? So I look at a painting like this. This is a very, you know, sort of, um, I would say, uh, unemotional, sort of a serious, conservative engineer view, what does a painting look like? Uh, it starts with the support. You've got to put it on something. And, and the support could be rigid, wooden panels. We've, talked, we've seen wooden panels. Or copper sheets. How many of you have seen paintings on copper sheets? Okay, They're not a lot because copper was expensive. But every once in a while, you'll see, usually they're fairly small um, uh, because it was expensive. And these are exquisite, just exquisite, because they don't absorb water, okay? And that is a critical factor. And so if the substrate is stable, even if you've got a brittle paint, well, then it's not going to be subjected to changes in tension, okay? So copper is, is fantastic, but it is very, very, very infrequent. Uh, or it could be flexible. And so this could be a linen canvas, which is certainly um, much stronger than cotton. Cotton is much more recent. That's the support. Now, depending upon how the canvas was stretched, for example, you saw pictures in Sarah's class of students stretching canvas. 
there will be different regions of uh, stress contours in that canvas. Actually, the stress is greatest right at the corners. And, and you can use different techniques in order to try to reduce that or at least uh, equalize it. But that's important. So there's going to be a residual stress. The environmental stress refers to, I'll talk a bit more about this, what happens to that substrate over time when it gets subjected to fluctuations in humidity. Okay, that's a problem. On top of the support is a ground. A ground uh, basically seals the support. It also provides a reflective substrate. So you see a painting because light is reflected off that painting. So light from the room hits the painting. Some of it's absorbed. The part that's not absorbed comes back to see you. If it absorbs in the red, you're going to see something that looks blue. And that light coming in from the outside gets a better chance of being absorbed if it hits this ground and then bounces off and then it's a chance to absorb again. Usually the ground is white, but grounds can be brown, they can be green, they can be black, depending upon what the artist wants to do. The paint, these are pigments in the binder, I talked a bit about that, and the varnish, this is usually done with oil paints. Um, the pragmatic reason for doing, using varnish um, is that it protects the painting. Uh, remember, um, oil paints dry exceedingly slowly, so they remain tacky for a long period of time. So they can, uh, you know, dust can stick to them, uh, uh, particulates in the air from burning coal can stick to them. Uh, you cover it with varnish, and uh, unfortunately after about 50 years or so, the varnish has turned dark brown. You get the varnish removed, and then you've got another 50 years, and, and you can keep doing that for several hundred years. Uh, but this is a layered structure. At each one of those layers, you transition from one kind of material to a different kind of material. It's got different properties. It absorbs water, more or less. It, it responds to temperature, more or less. So that leads to all sorts of interfaces where you have to worry about whether one layer will remain stuck to the one below it. Uh, key thing about wood, it's made out of cellulose. Cellulose absorbs water. The structure of wood is such that it's a, it's a porous structure, and there's all sorts of sort of complicated patterns of uh, the, the cellulose and, and the hemicellulose, which is a different kind of chain structure, and, and a glue kind of material called lignin, but that's not important right now. What is important is that under different relative humidity, if I take a piece of wood, if I take a piece of oak, and put it at, um, in, a, in a room at 50% uh, percent relative humidity for, let's say, six months, then I'm going to get um, a equilibrium moisture content of, I don't know, about 10% or so. It's going to be stable. If the relative humidity increases, well, then it's going to move towards a new equilibrium moisture content. If the relative humidity drops, well, then it's going to go to a lower one after a long period of time. Well, the thing that is important about this uh, with regard to wood, there are all sorts of ways of putting together a wood substrate. You've probably heard of cradling. You've heard of a variety of different ways of fastening the panel boards together. Well, the issue of constraint becomes critical. Here are sort of three examples of uh, panel boards from the side. A is, is fastened only at one end with my funny little screw here. Uh, the other end is free. And so 6% equilibrium moisture, 18%, 6%, that's sort of a sequence. So A can expand, going from 6 to 8%. It can expand freely. And then when I go back to 6%, it goes back to where it was. It's reversible, as long as it's not trapped in that frame. Let's do another one, B. This is uh, captured at the bottom. And at the top, it's, I don't have a screw there, but it can't expand any further. So in this case, it can't swell. So it's constrained, it can't swell. And then what happens when it relaxes, when you change the relative humidity, this 18% where it can't swell, it has caused the wood cells to collapse. There's, it's called a compression set. 
And so they sort of collapse that fold just a little bit. So when it dries back down, it's shorter. Now, you can imagine that if uh, one side of this board were painted and the other side were not, then you get more water going in from one side than the other, and that would lead to, lead to it curving, because you'd have that compression set be greater uh, on the outside. Finally, if you have a board that is trapped between so, uh, two kinds of fixtures, and so 6 to 18, it's, it's, it's under um, uh, a, a lot of, of compression here, and then when it relaxes, it can break apart. A joint between two boards can, can, can be severed, or the board itself can crack. This is the reason, or this is the idea, why panel boards both warp and crack. It's this question of constraint. Yeah? I'm just a little confused. Are these boards next to each other or on top of each other? So this is an experiment showing, or this is basically, it's trying to show what happens to boards under different sets of constraint. In fact, all the boards would, would be under the same condition. It's just that maybe you have them under condition A or condition B or condition C. I'm comparing them together because uh, conditions B and C, which have some sort of constraint, can lead to either warping or can lead to fracture. Condition A, where it's unrestrained, that's great. But you have to worry about the painting falling apart. So, it, so it's a balance here. What about a fabric? So um, probably know about the design of a fabric with, with the warp yarn going in the sort of long direction, the weft weaves back and forth. It's a different, even if it's the same size um, uh, fiber, it's a different way of stringing it together. And there are many different ways to make fabrics. So this is an anisotropic material. This behavior in one direction is different from the other. And then it absorbs water um, in, in ways that are much like that of the wood. Uh, I won't go into the details of this, only to say that if you change the temperature and if you change the humidity, all of these up and down zigs and zags are changes in the tension. And so, usually, uh, a simple cycle of uh, hum humidity change or temperature change is not going to cause your painting to fa fall apart. 10,000 cycles, maybe, and, and it's little bitty changes over time. That is the issue. And so you talk to any conservator or any museum person, and, and you've probably seen this. Who's gone into a museum and seen this little bitty box in the corner with some sort of recording on it? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's just an analog, usually it's an analog record of what the temperature and the humidity are, it's some sort of you know, double pen recorder. And the key thing is to keep it constant. Ideally, it's 50% relative humidity and probably 65 Fahrenheit or something like that. But the, you want to keep it constant. That's the key. Okay, so uh, I'm just about done. I've got four, five slides, but basically I'm just about done because I want you to know the name Spike Bucklow. Think of Spike, okay? Spike Bucklow. This is a paper in 1997, which is the first paper in studies in conservation, it's the first paper that gave a path to quantifying this crackle, to quantifying the crackleur structure. Uh, art connoisseurs for 300 years had been uh, had recognized that the crackle was important and somehow linked to materials and technique, but they couldn't figure out a way. Bucklow did. Bucklow's going to have a, a residency at Stanford this this fall. Uh, but what he determined, I'm not going to go through any any of these words, but what he did to determine was that the patterns of the crackle depend upon the thickness of the ground, the, the, the nature of the ground, um, the uh, nature of the substrate, for example, panel. And so what he determined in this whole series of, uh, first of all, establishing what are sort of common um, um, indices of the crackle, uh, direction, perpendicular to grain, and so forth, uh, as well as what are the particular sort of classes of material use. And so, 14th and 15th century paintings on panel, okay, this is what you would find. This is predictive. This is quite high in terms of probability. 15th, 16th century paintings on panel, Flemish, different crackle pattern. Dutch, 17th century paintings on canvas, yet another pattern. 
and French 18th century paintings on canvas. So with Bucklow's paper in 1997, there have been a whole series of people that have uh, attempted to both follow on, get more data. There's at least four PhD theses that have extended this. Bucklow actually has a, a bachelor's, from University of Cambridge has a bachelor's degree in chemistry, has a mass, you know, a diploma in artificial intelligence, a master's in conservation science, and a PhD in art history. Yeah. He's, he's got it all, okay? He's written several books. He's on the alchemy of paint is one of them. And, and, and what he has done is he has set the stage for a predictive use of Krakalur, uh, uh, analytical technique to monitor paintings. And so what has come from uh, all of his imitators and followers has been that there's a very large sort of image analysis community now that, that can look at patterns, they put it in a high contrast mode, they do a top hat kind of algorithm to, to see where all these lines are. You can see how closely they're spaced. It uh, turns out the closer they are, that's a sign of the th thinness of the ground. Uh, and, and the idea comes in the final slide. I'll get to it. Let me summarize. Technical issues of, of what we've talked about, both in terms of hands-on uh, and, and in terms of sort of the, the background theory, a painting is a physical object. And it's derated by a variety of routes. What happens in, during that degradation process, either due to light or to heat, uh, is that it gets brittle. Once it gets brittle, then all of these fluctuations in dimensions due to pickup of water apply a tension. And you exceed the tensile stress of the strength of the material. And this is what Bucklow has proven. The linkage to material choices um, is, is clear. All right, that is the most limited piece of information from our presentation. A little bit beyond that, is in, in this case, should you care at all? Okay, you came here, so you cared a little bit. Um, there are very serious proposals that, um, in um, uh, currently, with uh, you know all the talk about big data, all the talk about digitization of you know the world's written uh, resource, all the books that are in print that can be digitized and stored away, um, you can do the same thing with paintings. And, and you can use a, an automated digital analysis and a subsequent crackle uh, interpretation to monitor that painting, you know, every 10 years or something like that. Well, you say, well, so what? If you see that it's changing, um, you probably don't want to go into any sort of extensive kind of restoration with relining and pressing and so forth, but you could take it off display. You could take it out of a room where it's got the, the fluctuations in humidity, store it away for 10 years in a fixed environment. At least it won't get any worse, and you could bring it out periodically. Um, the technical analysis that I've been describing, and this is just a very, very small part of all sorts of technical analysis, it's not going to replace an art connoisseurship. The, the art connoisseurs wouldn't let it, okay? Uh, but, but it can complement. It can complement. And, and finally, and, and this is the message uh, I almost put this one in italics because this is a message for our students. I, I'm on a mission. My mission is, is to get our Stanford undergrads to take our classes to realize that if a painting is made of materials, then everything's made of materials. Mm -hmm. Everything is made of something. And so if, if something is incongruous as well, why should I worry about whether a painting cracks or not? It's made of materials. It's made of things with different components and different stresses and so forth. Look at the world around you, okay? You get a better appreciation, maybe. Thank you. Thank you.